Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildra, and I am your Gaming Monk for the evening. This is Day 20 of the RPG A Day 2019 Challenge. Today's word is noble. Now, what instantly comes to mind is the idea of noblemen, and I suppose with that in mind, I should talk about some games that have players playing as nobles in some regard and playing the game of nobility, I should say. Roland keeps that L5R is used. Maybe I'd be a little more favorable if I hadn't spent over a decade playing L5R, but it is what it is. So instead, let's talk about games that do have this kind of motif, but aren't tied to the, mo the poor man's attempt at trying to rebel against Lord of the Rings. Pendragon and, of course, L5R, Legend of the Five Rings, have been very big inspirations for me in this regard. Pendragon for its more historical approach, and L5R for its more theatrical approach. See, I remember a long time ago, George Martin, who I have some disagreements with, argued that because of, the char because of so many characters being nobles or having that kind of background in Lord of the Rings, that the game was elite... not the game, the book was elitist and classist. I find this to be highly, um, I can't really call it offensive, but it's, but I can't think of a more appropriate term, because it's a case where I think he was looking, seeing the forest for the trees. You're dealing with, with a lot of those sorts of stories, and a lot of stories in general, you have aspirational characters who are going to be larger than life and have to take on responsibilities that equate that that are going to be of a higher caliber than the responsibilities that an average person would. And, as Professor Geek had pointed out, trying to act like the cathartic character is somehow more mature or more believable or what have you, than the aspirational one is not only childish, but it's irresponsible. But getting beyond the that... The thing is, is that even with the kind of high social position that you're in, I think the reason why that sort of thing is still going to be appealing is because there's still threats that you still have to deal with. And that's why one of the things that I am, um, I hope to cover in the future is when, is doing a retelling of Dragon Age Two in a tabletop format, starting out with with um with black-collar work and then going up to white-collar work, but still having to deal with cutthroats on both sides of it. Because the thing is, when, you, when you're in that position, there's, of course, going to be a lot more people gunning to work with you and a lot more people work, working to gun against you. And I think that using that in storytelling is far more viable than trying to figure out whether one is more believable or mature, which is just a case of bleh. But the reason I wanted to focus on Pendragon and L5R in this case is because in both instances you have a sort of honor code that's expected to be applied to, and thus it provides a very good baseline for heroic and villainous characters, as well as those who fall somewhere in the middle, how closely they follow that code, whether it be chivalry or Bushido. And this is also why, in the case of L5R, the Scorpion Clan, which I want to talk about for a bit, is a fascinating paradox. They are liars, cheaters, backstabbers, and thieves. And yet, they are the most loyal of any clan to the Empire. Even loyal to the point where they would be willing to stage a coup d'etat against it for its own sake. Because in their the way they see it, they would become the villain so that all the other clans would focus on them and distrust them instead of, instead of falling into infighting with each other. Or as much infighting as you can when, the, when you're decreed that you do not wage war against each other. Which is something that doesn't always work, but the intent is still there. I think it's also the reason why I like why well, I like characters like, say, Garrick and Gold Ducat. They certainly have their own code, but it's one that is very 
open to interpretation. And when you have something like that, a code that can be backed on to see whether or not people are following it or, or not, and how they interpret what they, what's considered following that code, it makes for very fascinating storytelling. And it makes for even more fascinating role-playing. To use the example with the RVT crew, take Aristeo von Brenner, um, Lord Fussybutt, as it were. He is an ass. However, he's, however, once we later see his brother, who is an even bigger ass, it's quickly clear that as much of an ass as he is, even he has his line. As, to reference a certain trope, even evil has standards. So you can be a stuffy asshole, but being a stuffy asshole should not be the beginning and ending of that particular conversation. 